And we're live from the south of France with Will Lee. Hi, Will. I know we are. I thought we were somewhere on Earth, but I guess. <laughs> well, well I, I've, I've been told that France is part of Earth. Is that not a thing? It's an un unearthly Earth. It's good to see you. <laughs> it's good to see you, too. I miss you. The, the last time I saw you, I think, was at a Molly Malone's gig, I'm thinking. Probably. You're in California, IA, right? I am in California, although I could be anywhere because I really haven't left my house for a year. So it, it, we, we have to talk about the COVID stuff, Will, because is that what took you to France? What took you to France? Uh, well, we were actually trying to figure out where to go from. The first thing that we did was we. I will. Oh, oh God. <laughs> That's that's bad. That's that's. I'm sorry. Anyway, I'm trying to get you on Facebook so I'll be able that's to see. Flashing before us. Wait a minute. I want to be able to see the comment. My, my, uh, my groovy lights, man. You have, it, you have, oh, although I don't know, that might be a little crazy making. It's kind of cool, but it might be hard. It might be distracting from your beautiful face. Oh yes, my, that's exactly what I need the lights for to do just. <laughs> So I'm thinking that, uh, yeah. Uh, so, oh, look at that. Oh, oh, come on. Oh, we finally have the same. Pa Wait, the green is the same Patty's Day thing we were craving. That's it. There Happy it Patty's Day, everybody. And to you. Are you Irish, Will? I am. Happy St. Patty's Day. To you. Thank you. Aaron, so, go whatever. So I know I'm a Jewish girl. I know nothing about it. I just eat corned beef and cabbage, and I'm now I can only have the cabbage. Are you still a vegan, vegetarian? Are you doing that? Yeah, two, two and a half, three years now. And is that a challenge in France? No, not really. No. Great croissant tonight Ooh. with Eric Colvert for dinner, some green right. beans. Okay, so let's talk, let's go back to uh, what brought you to France. What, do you, what are you doing there? We started in New York, and when it became apparent that all the gigs were were gone, had gone out the window, right? I was going to do a festival in Japan that got canceled, and we were supposed to, supposed to go down to St. Bart's for a, a little quick vacation. And then we realized that they were about to close the border down there. So uh -huh. in three hours, we were on our way to the airport. As uh -huh. soon as we got out, so. We have friends down there. We stayed there for four months, which was really sweet. What, what, what was it like? What was COVID like there in St. Bart's? Very restrictive. Couldn't see a beach for the first two or three months we were there. Couldn't go to the beach. Were you house Were you homebound as we were here? Yes, we were very restricted, very confined. You had to fill out paperwork and bring your passport with you if you needed to go out for like a half an hour to go quick for a quick walk or a to hit the store. And did you do that? Did you guys go to the grocery store and stuff? Sure. I haven't been in a grocery store in a year, Will. So if you're talking to like, forget it. Yeah, that's oh, how well, I guess you have deliveries. We have Instacart and stuff that I don't know if you have that in, in St. Bart's, but yeah. Nothing like that. So you, had to, so you had to get your, your mask on and you had to go out and fill, fill out your paperwork, go out for the small amount of time that you were allowed to and stand in a line at the grocery store because they were only letting very few people in these massive uh, supermarket. You could, they would only have like 10 people in the whole place. At, right. At the most, you know, and big, big distance between you and anybody else, including outside, you know, you'd be with your little cart, you'd be waiting <laughs> outside for, for an hour or two. Yeah. Way behind somebody else. Right. Yeah. Anyway, so so to fat to answer your question about how we got here, uh, you know, this is Saint Bart's is practically France, so it wasn't a big deal. Since I I have a French passport, luckily, since I'm married to a French person who got me into the club. Of do you have dual, do you have dual citizenship? Mm -hmm. Wow, nice. Yeah. Oui. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about how you and Sandrine met and how long you've been together, which I know is forever. But yeah, okay. So you had you had a French passport. How how was it to fly? It was uh, God. It, you know, it was lengthy because you had to take three flights, and something got weird where we had to stop at at a place we weren't supposed to, and then we missed the flight after that. 
and that cost us an extra eight or nine hours. So it was a four hour trip and it was exhausting, but it was, it was smooth as far as paperwork goes. Cause it was kind of like going from France to France. So it was right, easy. right, right, right. Had we gone to the States first, it would, there would have probably been some confinement involved and a bunch of stuff, made some more red tape. So we just skipped it, skipped that part of it, even though we felt like we wanted to go back and just check in and see what was happening. We right. skipped it. Came right to France. So I haven't been to, to New York in over a year now. So somebody's keeping an eye on your place and doing all of that. And a friend that'll go water the plants and check the mail. Right, you know. right, right. You got that going on. It, does it feel strange? I mean, I'm sure this is the longest you've gone without being in New York. That has to be a little bit odd. It is, but it's also, I'm doing what I always want to do with my free time, which is write and record and you know, I'm doing plenty of sessions and stuff for people all over the, all kinds of sessions, weird stuff like, you know, Elvis impersonators and <laughs> jazz fusion and, every, and pop and blues. All okay, so you set up, did you always have a studio there in France or have you set it up in COVID? I had a, a, a sort of minimal version of what I have now. And now it's a bit more complete with like, you know. Wow. <laughs> You know, instrument. How'd you get? How'd you get the? How'd you get the instrumentation over there? I would bring. I would bring like one each time I came over. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this is uh, my mother-in-law's house. This is where Sandrine's mom lives. We're, we're guests. We're yeah. like perfect guests all of a sudden. Well, and how many bases would you say that you own in in the world, approximately? Close to like 125, 130, maybe. Of course you do. That may, be, that may be a short estimate. I just gave like 15 or 20 away to uh, Little Kids Rock. Oh. Yeah. Oh, good for you. Um, uh, how many bases does a bass player need? Uh, is that like a light bulb question? Yeah, oh. like one, one more is, I think, yeah. I believe the answer to that question is, yeah. So, so you brought them one over at a time. You have your your microphone and your recording stuff, and and I and is the room well soundproof? So you're no, not at all. It's just a just an extra bedroom. I could have I could probably treated, but you know what? I like to keep it so because it's not my house, so, so to so to speak. So I, I yeah. like to leave a small footprint. I mean, even the lights that are up are like ones that when you turn them off they kind of disappear you know yes, they're they do. Kind of, yeah yes they do we're, we're green for saint patrick's day everybody by the way um because we'll, no, neither will nor i had any green clothing to put on i have not i don't own a green thing i'm I, 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 you know it's okay when there's nobody there to pinch you it's fine <laughs> there's been no there's been no oh gosh so all right so tell me about your COVID. then you'll get your pinching in go ahead not Tell just. me, so you're, you're, how is the COVID being treated in the south of France? Uh, it's being treated with not a great supply of uh, vaccine. So not you were not vaccinated, I'm going to assume? Not yet. Okay. The one vaccine you can get is, is really under serious uh, scrupulousness right now. Oh, the, uh, the, uh, what, yeah. The AstraZeneca. Astra AstraZeneca, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they, and you know, the funny thing is like America and England bought a lot of stuff and put the money in before France did. So stuff that maybe France should have, America has a lot of, and that's, that includes the, especially the AstraZeneca. Right. You know, which America has, seems to have a stockpile of and are not even, really using it that much because the they're not using it i believe it was recalled here i don't think they're using it at all now yeah so there's some bad press on it or something and it's, it's it may be bogus it might be just like a one of those whisper campaigns you know somebody getting thrown under the bus unnecessarily because really they, maybe yeah there's a lot of doubt about whether or not these these uh, talks of of clotting you know yeah. that, the, that has been known to have like one or two people got blood clots out of millions, out of tens of millions. Right. Which is pretty good statistic, actually. 
would you would you would you take it will if that's all i had yeah mm -hmm. i think i would i think i would give it a go so having um an underlying condition having asthma have you been more cautious than you might have been otherwise no i would be very cautious about this very dangerous uh, disease yeah this pandemic thing is it's bad news so what does it look what, what does it look like over there for you guys have you do you get out um do you get out we we do yeah you can and there's a curfew here six o'clock p.m you got to be in mm -hmm. but you can go out and do whatever the stores are fine and and you know you get a mask up of course common right. and you have well, to do people mask in the south of france because people aren't great about it here washing hands yeah uh yes there are very few jerks around that's wonderful that's concerned but you know kids in the big cities are causing a lot of problems with that because they're just hanging wildly and bought, going to bars and losing control how open are things in france are the bars open in france are restaurants open for indoor dining uh no they're not mm -hmm. how about over there you know, uh, in Cal in LA, no indoor dining yet. Although I hear they're opening, they're going to start to open everything. They're going to about to open everything up. They just opened gyms up, which I think is insane. And um, there, my son manages a movie theater. They're about to open up a movie theater. Are you kidding me? I mean, this is insanity to me. I hate to be a, a governor or a a mayor right now, you know, because that's a that's a rough line to have to to to, to be on. Is the one between allowing your your people to be affluent enough to stay alive and survive business wise of course and then you know and stay alive uh health wise it's really yeah. rough have you have you had friends that have had the covid sure of course mm -hmm. absolutely i've had it T uh, what tell well i've you know i didn't know until i got an antibody test later but I was kind of under for a while and I didn't know what was happening. And I believe because I have type O negative blood, I think it might have saved my ass. You're supposed to be the most resistant from getting it. I think so. So it, where, where do you think you, you got it? How, do you know how? Anywhere. Would, do you think it was when you traveled from on the plane? No was idea. It, was it that time period when you were traveling? Kind of, yeah. Mm. yeah. I think I got it in New York, maybe. And were you at that Beacon? Were you were you at that Beacon Theater concert that Jackson Brown was at at the beginning of March? Weren't you there? I'm the musical director of that. I thought so. A lot of people got Jackson got it. That a lot of people got it right there. Not I only thought it. that was you. Oh my God! So. It, but we don't know what the actual source was. It could have been anybody. I was hugging Jackson a week before at the Wild Honey concert in LA. And then the week after the, the New York concert, he said that he had COVID. So what did it, what was it like for you? Oh, you didn't know at all? The, uh, what? Didn't know what? Having, having COVID. What, 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 how did you not feel well? We were just... Sandrine and I were both really under the weather, you know, just uh, it wasn't the typical thing that you read about. I think everybody has a little bit different version and, and some people it lasts like these weird residual things that you that you that you carry around symptom wise can stay right. with your lungs and your whatever your dizziness, your something, you know, your sense of balance. I don't know. Right. The long haulers have some crazy stuff. River Cross got a bad side thing called Guillain Barr oh. syndrome, which, uh, you know, his kind of legs just gave out underneath him and he had to basically get back in with physical therapy, get back wow. into work with the help of professionals. Wow. Yeah. Bad news for a lot of people. And for you guys, so for you guys, it was just a general malaise, a fatigue. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. but, but no, no fever, no sore throat, no stomach stuff, none of that. I don't remember any stomach stuff. Mm -hmm. 
And were you sick for a while or not so bad? Probably four or five days. Oh, okay. It was fluey maybe. A mm -hmm. bit fluey. Is this like a doctor show? You know, it, it, we, all right, I'm gonna get off the COVID. We're so, we're so COVID curious because we've had, uh, you know, Bet, Bet had it nasty. Yeah, that, so let's go with COVID. So, uh, no, we're not gonna talk COVID forever. I just, I'm really curious, especially because you're in another country and how it's being treated and it, it yeah. But in any case, we're, 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 we're gonna get off COVID. Let, let's get to more fun things. Get so, off COVID, that's a bumper. So, <laughs> so, so tell me what you're doing, uh, what, what you're doing over there. You said you're recording. What, what have you been working on since you've been over in France? Well, let's see, what have we been doing? Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I've had time to like really go down the rabbit hole of YouTube and find a bunch of old Letterman clips and stuff. And that's been fun to kind of look at, at stuff I completely forgot about. Wow. I can't believe that I forgot about playing with Curtis Mayfield. I can't believe it either. Wow. But, but you I played think, with every, you played with pretty much everybody. That's kind of why I was able to forget anything because there were thousands of things, you know. Yes. Anyway, um, so there's this is one band that I have that's that's uh, I'm the I'm the weak link in this band that it's a, a bunch of giant musicians. One guy is is uh, Jeff Babco, who's a fantastic keyboard player that does Jimmy Kimmel live and lots of sessions and lots of he plays with James Taylor sometimes and he's with Marty Short and Mark and uh, Steve Martin when they go out. Nice. Another guy is Jeff Coffin, whose saxophone player had been, had been with Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones, but now with uh, Dave Matthews Band, He's an unbelievable musician. And Keith Carlock, drummer extraordinaire, who lives down in Nashville, who's Steely Dan's drummer, among other things. He's also toured with Sting and John Mayer and other people. And a young guitarist, Mir Felder from New York. So we have this band called Band of Other Brothers. Nice. Boob. Boob is the name of the band. <laughs> and we've played at the Blue Whale, the now defunct Blue Whale in LA. And we've, and we've made an album in the past. We went down to Nashville and did a record a few years ago. And one of the guys, I think it was Near Felders, wrote everybody and said, hey guys, yes, we're in confinement, but how does anybody feel about doing like a, a new album, long distance? So I got really inspired and I started writing some, some stuff. And, you know, now we have an album in the can and we're just about to put it out kind of in the f pretty near future, I think. And boob too, I guess. I don't know what it's going to be called. <laughs> two boobs. Or two boobs. So, so how was that collaborative creative process when you were in different places? Um, I guess it's that everybody has the ability to, to sort of, I mean, those who write have the ability to sort of put things together in a, in a virtual way by themselves, you know, using maybe not real instruments, not real drums, and they can sort of, sort of do a sketch that sounds pretty good to, to communicate it to the other guys. Right. And they can all write charts. So we'll, we'll write a chart and we'll send a thing out. And then guys will, will do their version of what you sent them, you know? I mean, my and, ideas were pretty complete. So guys just kind of did really great versions of my ideas, basically. And that's kind of what we did for each other. And what kind of music is it, Will? Um, there's one vocal song that I sing, and that's a song by Jeff Babco called The Right Now Blues, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And the other stuff, I don't even know how to describe it. It's groovy harmonically and it's groovy otherwise, and it's fun to listen to. And I wrote one song with it that, that has a bass solo section and I'm playing, I'm, I'm thinking the chord changes felt really good. And I'm thinking that I'm gonna be playing a solo over this little section. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I'm playing along, I'm going, God, I, I gotta channel my inner Stanley Clark. If anybody knows who Stanley Clark is, he's this brilliant, innovative bass player who plays upright bass and electric bass. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking, you know, prodigy style. We're talking genius. And I'm thinking, what would Stanley do? Oh, you know, this, I got to channel my inner Stanley Clark. Wait a minute. I know Stanley Clark. I don't have to play. 
Let me call Stanley and see if he wants to do it. So he liked it. And I got Stanley Clark to play on my wow. team. Wow. That's very cool. Yeah. And, so. I think that's very unusual for a bass player to bring in a bass player. I, I really love that. You, you're a very humble guy in all kinds of ways. And, and that's one of your charms for sure. Uh, that's yeah. lovely. The funny thing about writing is when I, when I write songs, I can't think of bass parts for my own tunes. <laughs> it's really oh. weird. Wow. So, yeah. and I know bass wasn't your first instrument. Maybe we ought to go there now. From, from what I recall, you know, I found out later that you were a horn player also, but I believe you started on the drums. Is that, is that true? I think so. And, and I, I know the answers to a lot of these questions, but I'm going to ask you because people out there don't. Um, what, what, was your, what, what was your musical awakening, Will? Beatles. <laughs> It was the Ed Sullivan show, yeah? Was that yeah, the day? Absolutely. Well, you know, my parents were jazz musicians, and that, and that was all well and good, and it was great to be growing up around that and taking it all for granted and not realizing that everybody's household wasn't exactly like mine, you know? But the first musical sound I remember hearing is Miles Davis' muted trumpet. Wow. Playing My Funny Valentine or something. You know, something at some late night smoky party my parents were having, and I came out in the pajamas, my pajamas. Mom, what's the sound? What's all that noise? <laughs> uh, that was typical. They were they were doing that all the time. We we're listening to jazz in the house. But when the Beatles came on, something else was sparked in me that got me really wanting to participate, really wanting to to play and and do just what, what I saw those guys doing. And when you pull to Ringo, is that why the drums? What, what, what pulled you to the drums? I had drums. Oh, you had, had bought me a set of drums years, years before, and I wasn't, wasn't doing anything with them. I wasn't inspired. I didn't feel like, you know, I wasn't hungry to do anything with them. But that, after that night at the Ed Sullivan show, I was Mr. Drums. <laughs> What was what was your father's primary instrument? He was a, a pianist, like bebop piano player, but he also wrote like sort of uh, neoclassical contemporary orchestra pieces and stuff too. He could do that. And he was also a, a, a life changing educator, as I recall. Is that so? Yeah, he took the University of Miami and uh, took a, a, a music school that was about to go away and saved it and, wow. and designed it and, you know, provided it with uh, programs and a faculty, you know, all this great stuff. And now it's like one of the big best music schools in the world. Amazing. It was and about to go away. It was about to go away, but he literally saved it because he got a call to be, we were, in, I was growing up in Texas and he had done a really good job with this little college in Huntsville, Texas. Mm -hmm. And the word was out about my dad and what he could do. And he got a call from the president of the University of Miami who said, can you come and be the head of the fine arts department? And he said, if you let me keep the music school a separate school, I will. Wow. Yeah, it was about to just get sucked into the fine arts department and tucked wow. away. Did your father, so did your father encourage you? I mean, you had a drum set, so was he, uh, how did you start playing trumpet? You played, tr did you play trumpet? Was it, was it, you, how did that happen? Why did that happen? I think my, my dad sat my brother and I down, my brother's 13 months younger, sat us down, because my dad, his real passion was trumpet, but he, he had gotten tuberculosis as a, as a, as a teenager. Wow. He was forced to stop playing. And that's when he picked up the piano, but he thought it might be cool to, to sort of get his sons involved in playing some trumpet. So he gave us a couple of trumpet lessons and I had about one and a half chops on the trumpet and my brother was sort of not interested. So he just put his in the case and never took it out again, but I kept going and got into school into the school band you know and started being a trumpet guy for a while for a bunch of years until i was in high school and got talked into switching over to french horn which was a big mistake wow because uh i sucked on the french <laughs> horn really bad 
<laughs> and, right. and you're and you're not but you're playing drums out in the world though while you're in school aren't you or are you not once we got to miami and the beatles had had appeared on the ed sullivan show well right before we had moved there while we were still in texas by the way mm -hmm. later that same year this is when we moved to, to miami 1964 and um yeah so i when I got to Miami, I started looking around for, for other kids my age to start a band with. And I was playing drums still at that point. And we were so young that the kids didn't know, you know, they didn't know from bass. They knew, you know, everybody was buying guitars and drums and drums and guitars. And uh, it was a little bit out of our, our thought, you know, process to figure out what what the function of a bass was exactly. My brother's band didn't have a bass. They were like they played that Ventures music, and they didn't even have a bass player. They had, yeah, two well, guitars and a drum. Yeah, that's what we had to do in the beginning because we didn't have a PA. We played Ventures music. <laughs> we didn't do any vocals. When did you realize that you could sing? When did that happen for you? I didn't. I haven't realized that yet. <laughs> Good one. Yeah. I'm serious. I hear real singers. I go, oh, what am I doing? I can't sing. Uh, you've done quite well with it. Yeah, me and Celine Dion. You're right. <laughs> well, not quite that. You've done you've done more sessions than I think anybody in the world, and you've plenty of them have been on vocals. So uh somebody thinks you can sing. I've been lucky. I'll tell you what. I'll I want to tell you about a gig that I got because I couldn't sing. Okay, wait, is, is this going to be the, the, the voiceover thing, Teddy Grahams? Yeah. Okay, let's go. I want to hear this story. So they were having auditions for this new product called Teddy Grahams. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the gig was to come in and sing your version of uh, just want to be your teddy bear, right? <laughs> so I get up to the microphone and I'm like, oh, yeah, man, I can, I'm going to throw down some Elvis right about now. <laughs> I did my, my best Elvis impression, and I think what happened was, it was such a bad Elvis impression that apparently they didn't really want Elvis. They wanted some unique sounding voice, and I thought I was Elvising my ass off. <laughs> but instead of that, it, did you remember the producers? Of course. It was one of those "That's a Hitler" moments. <laughs> <laughs> That I got the gig. Well, you don't know. That's it's it's funny. It's not a bad thing. Oh no, it's not a bad thing. That's our Hitler. I mean, that's kind of a weird sentence unto itself, but that is. You don't really want to walk around the neighborhood saying that to. <laughs> no, you don't. Wait, what's our Hitler? So, so, so you got the gig because you couldn't do because you couldn't do Elvis because. I, so. I thought I was great. <laughs> yeah. But apparently I was so bad that we want him. Okay, so so let's get this. So so you're playing drums, you're playing horns. You're when, when do you start playing? When's what's your first what's your first band? You're doing venture music. You're how old are you when you're when you're playing out? I must have been uh, maybe twelve, I guess. Oh wow! Yeah. Our first gig was a CYO Catholic Youth Organization picnic. Three guys, six bucks a guy. <laughs> you got paid on your first gig? Yeah, baby. I, I, that was my day, first day in business. That is happening at 12. And were your parents encouraging you to do to do this? Oh, man. They were like, I don't know what they were doing. They were loose. They were so like, yeah, whatever, you know, just do whatever. We're doing whatever you do, whatever, you know, it's kind of very loose. And uh, I don't know, it's it's interesting. It's, it's, it was a different kind of encouragement. It was like a hands off kind of encouragement. Mm -hmm. They were proud that I had made a, a lighting, a light system. You know, they would ask me to, to stand in front of the strobe light I had made and jump around. So, so their friends could see what it looked like. <laughs> So you were kind of the show and tell at the at the little cocktail parties. I believe that was my main purpose. <laughs> yeah. So 
So you're doing these gigs, you're, 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 you're playing drums, you have this little, is it, is it a trio? What, are you doing a trio? What are you doing? Two guitars and drums, doing ventures, doing literally rock and run, doing venture stuff, whatever their, their songs were, Pipeline and those kind of things, the Chantays. Oh, so, <laughs> so what evolves, so you're 12, how, how, how do you get over to the bed? Are you singing, oh, do you eventually start to sing while you're drumming? We start to get a little bit different. Uh, once we got a PA, mm -hmm. start doing some vocalizing. We had a saxophone player who sang a little bit, and still two guitars, saxophone, and drums. Wow. Okay. Why get a bass when you can get a saxophone player? <laughs> really? At that age, nobody was doing bass. Literally, nobody in our little sphere of of peers, you know. So. I, uh, we got an offer to do a, oh, actually, the first thing that happened was I said, I wanted to, I want to get a more professional sound happening. Let's get a bass player. And what ended up happening was we actually, there was a guy whose father owned a music store who played drums. This kid played mm -hmm. drums. And his father said, if you guys get my son in the band, I'll give you a gig out in, on a trailer in front of the strip mall music store. <laughs> yes. so my, my first gig was playing as, as a bass player was playing in front of that music store for like three people, whoever was wandering by out of their car and into the store down in South Florida. And it was like we when we were rehearsing i was thinking man this is cuz i had been the lead singer by the way in this band where where we had drums saxophone and two guitars when i got on the bass and and saw how tough it was to sing those songs while playing bass i couldn't believe it okay I wait went, let's talk about how could it be harder to play and sing with the bass than i the drums no uh well drums are kind of just like a repetitive you know it's almost like you're it's almost like you're just doing this with your body you know you're just doing a thing and you just keep doing that one thing over and over again with the drums and occasional fill maybe or something but most okay. of it's just, a, it's just a samey thing that you if you're not singing you start thinking about did i leave the iron on <laughs> so you're saying dr drums don't like require much brain power <laughs> right there's plenty of brain power left to sing. Okay. Except bass. Imagine like Paul McCartney or any kind of pattern and singing a melody and a, and a lyric that you need to sort of, that you're trying to communicate something to somebody with. You can't be thinking about this. You got to deliver that, that message, whatever that is, you know? So you have to be, you almost have to, you have to re replace that drum pattern with something way more intricate notes and rhythm now you're talking about a melodic thing and rhythm not just rhythm anymore you know right it's like another world to be a singer while you're playing bass than it is to, to play drums drums takes more air and stamina you have to be more physically fit i would think you have to be like a runner almost you know to mm -hmm. get off well. so is it do, is the secret if you're playing bass to be so sure of to know so well memorized what you're gonna so that you're not thinking about that you're just thinking about this yeah this has has to become second nature so that you can deliver the message for sure yeah it's got to be completely parked somewhere else in, in another part of your brain that you're not using wow so what so what if you're in a situation where you're improvising or you're sitting in and you've got to do both things then you'd have to be esperanza spalding <laughs> i don't know if you know who that is <laughs> this one person on earth that can just really deliver a vocal and a bass part to die for wow okay so 
So you start playing bass and you've added, you, you have a bigger band now. So how does this evolve? So you're already making money. How does this? Oh, making tons of money. We're up to like eight bucks a gig at this point. Eight bucks a gig. So how does this translate? You, you finished school though. You, you finished high school. Yeah. And yes. you're playing gigs throughout all of school. You're playing gigs. Throughout all this time. Yeah. And by the time I left, uh, Miami, I was in eight bands going to college. Oh my God. Yeah, it was nuts. It was really nuts. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe the schoolwork wasn't your primary focus in those days. Would that be correct? It became more so after I almost got flunked out of college. It became a little bit more important for me to try to hang on. Yeah. Okay. So that was tough. Because I was gigging uh, six nights a week, six sets a night what? until four in the morning. And then I had an eight o'clock theory class every day. Did I you, know. did you, uh, did you make it through college? Uh, no, I got, I got this call to come up and join this band in New York dream. Okay. So I know. So had it, so tell us that story, how that happened. Cause that's a crazy story. Well, there was a band. There were there were some really gorgeous horn bands happening on Columbia Records. We had Chicago, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and there was this other band that was super innovative musically called Dreams. And they, Dreams had the uh, Dreams had Billy Cobham, and it had both Brecker Brothers in it, and that's just those three guys that you know about. But everybody else in the band was like virtuoso, killer, you know, just could do anything you know, play circles around anybody musician wise. And my peer group at the time, I was a guy who was playing rock and roll at night in clubs, but I was studying jazz in the daytime. Mm -hmm. And by now I was majoring on bass, by the way, at the University of Miami. I had given up the French horn and all that stuff that was making me flunk out of, you know, flunk out it of life. It was the French horn's fault. I knew that. I know. Blame it on the damn French horn. When or the doubt. Bossa Nova, whichever. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. And like in my small group of like really close friends, we were enthralled by this band Dreams. They had one album out on Columbia and we were gathering, you know, come over to my house and listen to Dreams on my new stereo, man. You know, we'd wear out copy after copy of this record. and We couldn't get over it. To, to some of us, it was like the next Beatles, you know, it was like the next biggest amazing thing to focus on it, to dwell on it, to talk about. Wow. Uh, one day I'm sitting in, uh, this is the strangest thing. I'm sitting in, in big band class, class, I guess, big band, whatever. It's a class. We're just reading music and playing big band music. Mm -hmm. Somebody slapped a note on my, on my app that said, call Randy Brecker and phone numbers on there. And I'm, I couldn't put it together because it was so out of context. Why do I know that name? You know, meanwhile, I've been listening to him every day and every night, dreams. And I call up and they say, look, uh, we want you to come up and audition for, for dreams. I said, well, are you serious? Is this a crank call? You know, what's going on here? <laughs> I don't know anybody in New York. I never thought of going there. And it turned How out that they- How did they hear about you? Then a guy that came down to guest lecture at our school at the University of Miami from New York who knew these guys and knew that they were looking for somebody. And I flew up, auditioned. Wait a minute, while this guy is guest lecturing, he somehow hears you play well, bass? We jammed together at the end of the day after he did his little guest lecture thing. We, there was a jam in Coconut Grove, some arts festival, and we sat down and we just played. No, no, no songs were called, we just played. You know, a bunch of people. Wow. There was a lot of that going on back then. And he went back and said, you got to check this Miami kid out. I think he's your guy. And they're like, well, we, we never heard of him, but, uh, you know, we'll call him and see, see if we could talk him into flying up. And if he makes the audition, we'll pay him back for the flight. <laughs> Did you have enough money? Did you have money saved from all those $8 gigs? I got, I had enough. Mm -hmm. I had enough for a flight and I got paid back. So I've been in, in the black ever since. 
<laughs> which very few musicians can actually say. So you're very, it's been a blessed, uh, talented life. We have a, uh, we have, there's a French expression that when it translated into English, it means um, his ass is lined with noodles. <laughs> sort, of what, sort of what you say when you're playing the game of pétanque, which is like bocce ball. Yeah. The guy's like, he's hitting everything right on the money. He's, he's hitting, he's hitting the other guy's ball, knocking it out and he's, and he's getting all the points. Somebody will at some point during the game say that phrase. So say, say in English what it means again. His ass is lined with noodles. Ass is lined with noodles. And and how do you say it in French? I don't know. Okay. Uh -huh. You know. <laughs> okay. Do you speak French? No. And that was French, by the way. <laughs> you don't speak French. You're there. In... Okay. So funny. I study every day. I'm using the Duolingo app. I'm okay. On a, okay. On a streak. Not going to have a conversation for a few years, I don't think. Okay, because I, I, I've been thinking about doing it myself. Because I go to those meetings in Paris, and I've been thinking about doing it. No, huh? What Not work. What are you thinking about doing? I'm thinking about trying to do either Duolingo or the other one where you can learn and to. Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. Duolingo and something else. I think Babbel. The other one's called Babbel, I think. Yeah. Do Babbel and Duolingo. I think you'll be. You'll have a good edge on this. <laughs> the great thing about I, I, I'm not sure about the Babel system, but the Duolingo system is gonna like a it's gonna be a nudge every day. You're gonna get a, an email. Did you do your thing yet today? And, and do you, you do it every day? Every day. You do it every day. Do you ask Sandrine to talk to you and your mother-in-law to talk to you in French? No, I don't want to waste their time. <laughs> but maybe you'll learn that way. Maybe that's an easy. To use them because they're going to have to slow down and, and not use any slang, you know, and it's not going to be any fun for them. Okay, so we're segueing right now. So, how did you meet Sandrine? How long ago was it? And how did you guys meet and fall in love? I, um, okay, so there was a little restaurant that was really close to a lot of things in, in one little area of New York, and, and it was really close to the Letterman show. And it was kind of in between uh, the Letterman show and a, and a couple of re recording studios and a particular <laughs> rehearsal studio, SIR, that was right in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you had any time or even when you had no time, but you needed a meal, this was a great place to go. The service was uh, incredible and the food was really, really good. Well, what was the name of the place? Oh, Cafe Cielo. It was on 8th Avenue between 5-2 and 52nd and 53rd Street. Okay. That's 7-Eleven. But <clears throat> you'd go in and, you know, I, I took many dates there and Sandrine was my waitress many times, you know. Apparently, <laughs> Chick loved that, man. Um, <laughs> now she's my wife. But uh, it, was, it was one of those things where, like, I think I, I needed a date for something. And um, uh, I needed a date for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony. That's pretty damn nice. Extra, extra ticket for, you know, band wives or whatever. And the first thing that happened was I took her on a, a practice date to see how it, it was going to go. Wait, had you guys, would you like, would you have conversation with her while you were on dates with other women and stuff? You'd gotten to know her a little bit? Not as much, but what I would, you know, what, once I what, wasn't with someone and I walked in for, to sit at the bar and have a meal or sit at the bar, and just have a, a Coke or something, mm -hmm. would be bartending or waitressing or both. In fact, she was so good and so aware that once she stopped working there, all of a sudden the service was terrible. <laughs> it was all her. Oh, she was do running the whole joint. Wow. How many yeah. years ago was what year was this? Will? Oh man, um, it's probably right. You know, start probably started beginning nineteen end of nineteen ninety eight or something. Okay. Um. So. 
um, it, it was not like a love at first sight thing at all. It was way more organically uh, developed than that. And it, it was one of those things where like, I was literally hanging out with her somewhere and these words came out of my mouth that I didn't know where they came from. I had nothing to do with falling in love at all. I, it wasn't me for the first time ever. I, in fact, I had given up on love. I had decided that I wasn't going to be with anybody because it never worked out. Had you oh. had a long-term relationship before that? Yeah, I had a few. I'd had a marriage before that. Okay. And every time that uh, that I was in one of those situations, it was unbeknownst to me, it was it was me trying to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And when I finally decided I was never meant to be in a relationship, I said, I'll, "I'm just going to be happy being with myself." You know, I'm just going to be good old Uncle Will. He never found anybody, but he's a good guy and whatever. I was I had completely given myself up to that and resigned any idea of ever you know making that thing happen because i realized i tried it was me trying to force it all those years and it just wasn't a good way to do things so why try you know were you were you attracted to a specific kind of wrong woman did you keep mating with the same because i have a, did you keep mating with the same I, kind I of person you, i know what you mean but no i don't, I don't have that kind of mm -hmm syndrome if you will i was going to okay. say you know <laughs> present sickness, sickness works yeah <laughs> so so all right so you've given up and that that's what they always say right as soon as we stop looking that's when we find that's kind of what happens right yeah were you always looking for a guy in a big leather jacket with a with a knife you, you know no i didn't go out with any of the rockers that i booked i i didn't do that you know, I like evil bad guys oh, i like bad boys i oh. like that I, I didn't like, yeah, I liked bad boy. I like bad boys, you yeah. know. That's a cliche. Yeah. Well, not with knives and leather jackets necessarily, but they were bad to the bone kind of thing. Um, mm. But not anymore. I, I, I don't do that anymore. But we're going to talk about that too. We're going to talk about how we've changed those kind of ways too. Okay, so so how was your practice date? How did the, how did the practice date go? It must have gone well. Disaster. Oh. It was so awful. How so? Oh, she should tell you because she could make it sound way worse than I can. <laughs> <laughs> she was so, she hated it. I hated it. It was like, see ya. Wow. Oh. But then for some reason, there was something else in, there was something else in control. Something else was, had taken over and, and, you know, the conscious mind wasn't really controlling anything anymore. Was she impressed that she was going to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with no. you? No, she didn't. She didn't care. Couldn't care less. <laughs> tell, us, tell everybody a little bit about Sandrine because she's pretty amazing in her own right. She's a very talented, uh, very honest, very uh, something I never had, which is like self worth, kind of a thing. Yeah, she's got a lot of self worth somehow. It's like I deserve to enjoy myself, kind of stuff. I'm like, wow, whoa, slow down. What is that? I didn't recognize it at first. I'm like, wow, how do you get that? Um, like that mother in law you're living with must have done a pretty good job. Maybe, maybe though they they got separated early because her father took over. That's a long story, but but she okay. didn't really grow up in the mother's house. She grew up in the father's house. Mm -hmm. They divorced and the father took over for some reason. He was able to legally get custody and stuff. So this is kind of what the hang with, with the mom is a lot about making up for lost time. For wow. Me. I love that. They have a great relationship. Wow. Know? That's wonderful. And as I recall, the last time uh, you did this show, Sandrine had a book that had just come out of the most incredible photographs of nude. herself, nude, uh, in different, and she took the photos herself? Is, am I getting that right? With a timer, runs over to 
the whatever scene she set up. And they were like in like in like big public places. This was not like quiet little scenes, right? right. Yeah, that, that's what's that's what's really fun about a lot of them. A lot of them, she's more these days. She's more into taking these surreal looking photos in in uh, natural full moonlight. Mm. And when you look at it, it's, it's just got the eeriest feel because it's, it looks like day, but it's stars in the sky. And it's wait a minute. Wow. Kind of Magritte like in that way. OK, so you, so you went from having this disastrous first date, not, unimpressed with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You love comes out of your mouth before you know. And now it's 23 years later or something like that. And, and um, it seems to me every time that I've heard you speak of Sandrine, there's, I think the secret of your success is there's a lot of like a lot of respect. Um, I think like and respect are, I think they, I can't use the word Trump anymore. I, I, I never said his name when he was in office, but they, they, I think they're as important, if not more so than the love thing. I, I think for endurance, like and respect are huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's good to, to, to wake up and be really excited to see the, that person still there yeah, i love that all right so so you 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 get you you get into dreams which is your dream that this happens to you which is incredible and uh and and what happened had what happens that because there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens between that and you landing on uh late night how do you get there um i think that what the main thing that happened was studio work was a big thing that happened to me because um, when I first got to New York, I was such a bumpkin that I kind of didn't even know what studio work was. <clears throat> you know, I, I, I did, had plenty of records at home and listened to them all and thought I was listening to great bands playing. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these records were made by sidemen just guys for hire for that moment, for that record, for that day. Right. And when I got to New York, you know, a lot of the members of the band Dreams had, were doing this stuff on the side. They were doing records, record dates and commercials and, you know, a gig where you walk into a room uh, with, a, with a fresh bunch of other musicians you play a piece of music that you may never have to even th ever think about again and you walk out and you've just made a bunch of money for cool. doing that. you can turn your back on it and never even think about it again and go right to another room full of new fresh guys and musicians and people play a new piece of music do the best you can walk out the door and so I just, how, did, how did that door open for you well, I, when I when I first became aware of it, it was because I was invited to to come visit guys while they were going to a session and doing a session. I I had done sessions, you know, because I had bands. Right. This idea of of walking in on some singer that needs a band and you're not in her band, you're just going to make the record for her. Mm -hmm. And I saw these guys doing this, and I walked in with them, you know, it stayed in the control room as they went into the other room and, and made the music. And I just thought, this is the greatest gig there could ever be in the world. This is unbelievably so attractive. And I see that it's so attractive that how could it not be a thousand percent sewn up to the point where you'd have to be waiting in line forever to get into a situation like this? And I never thought of myself as ever being able to do it, but I was completely fascinated by it. Mm -hmm. And a couple of the guys that were part of this dreams thing, specifically Bob Mann, a guitar player, who's an extraordinary guitar player and musician. His father had been an organ player on soap operas and stuff. Brilliantly talented Psy man, Saul man. <laughs> um, and 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 another guy was Alan Schwartzberg, who's super uh, successful drummer in New York. Mm -hmm. um, 
They were sharing a house in Nyack. And when this band, Nyack is a little bit upstate from New York City, but you can drive in throughout the day and do your sessions and then go back up to this nice little country town, Nyack. <clears throat> and so they were, they were sharing this house. And when dreams folded, dreams came to an end because mainly because the drummer, Billy Cobham went on to join Mahavishnu Orchestra and sort of left us high and dry because the, the record company president at the time was Clive Davis. And he was trying to make this, this innovative band, a commercial hit making machine, which never was really meant to be that it had nothing else to offer, but he wanted top 40 music out of this band. So that was the beginning of the end that that kind of directive, you know, you do this, uh, we won't push the record. So okay. So Billy Cobham saw this other opportunity Mahavishnu Orchestra, which is way more interesting to him than becoming a top 40 band with these. Goofy right. And so the band was sort of fizzling and it did fizzle. And I was really going to be happy to go back to Miami where I'd be king of everything because I had been in this band dreams. Now I'm coming back to Miami with, armed with all this confidence and spirit in New York. <laughs> and these guys, Bob Mann and Alan Schwartz, Schwartzberg said, oh, no, you're not going to Miami. You're going to stay here. We're going to put you up in our house and we're going to get you some work. And I was like, okay, I'll take you up on it. Uh, and I think I must have been the worst house guest they could ever imagine because they started getting me work really fast. They wanted me out of there. And next thing I know, I'm doing gigs with BJ Thomas, thanks to Alan Schwartzberg. I'm doing studio work. Bob Mann is arranging commercials for Kentucky Fried Chicken and stuff. And I'm, I was called to come in, and get a bucket of chicken. Finger licking good. <laughs> hey, and stuff like that. And then, and then. Um, so you're singing, are, are you singing more than you're playing bass on these sessions? It was more playing, but a little bit of, you know, a guy like who was arranging the piece of music could say, I'm going to bring this singer in. You've never heard of him before, but I think he's good for this song. Another thing that happened was, Steve Gadd, the wonderful drummer, Steve Gadd, mm -hmm. doing sessions for a, a group of guys. And he and Tony Levin, the bass, bassist Tony Levin, were called for a lot of stuff together as a team. Mm -hmm. Tony couldn't do a thing. Yeah. And Steve said, I got this other guy I can bring in this, that could probably play, play this stuff really well. And they were doing a, a whole slew of contact cold pill commercials. They had a whole campaign for the year based on a song that was like, give your heart to your love. Oh no, give your hand to a friend, give your heart to your love, but give your cold to contact. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> so I'm going to be a player on some of this stuff. Uh -huh. and while I was there, one of the guys says, hey man, you know this, you're in this band Dreams, right? You kind of know what's happening. He said, hey, do you know anybody who can uh, sing like a white, blue-eyed soul kind of thing? Because they were doing all these different versions of the song. And I said, you mean something like, give your hand to come in tomorrow and sing this final for Contact Cold Pills. Wow. Hey, I'll be there. <laughs> wow. Like that. It was just, then that's how that whole thing started, just to, to become a, a snowball, you know, a snowball studio musician. So then how did it translate? Because then you started doing everybody's albums. Then you're on everybody, everybody's albums. And I, I started to make a list of the women that you've played with that maybe you could give us a couple of sentences. on. Like, I love people. <laughs> like Carly Simon. You, you played with Carly at the beginning when she was, from what I understand, stage phobic and shy. And so... Early days of Carly Simon, you, you're playing with Carly. You're you're doing albums with Carly. What, what what was that like? It was great. I mean, you know, we didn't didn't have to think about the the live thing mm -hmm. because she still has a, you know, she's still not ready to, ready to jump on stage at the drop of a hat. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have that bug. I don't think she'd rather not. 
uh, I think she enjoys making writing and, and creating the songs more than she likes to go out and sell the songs, you know. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of musicians like that. Bill Withers was the ultimate example of that. He really did not like to, he'd rather sit on the front porch and just talk shit, and tell stories, you know. He, he was not, he didn't have the bug to get on stage and look at me, you know, he didn't have that. Carly, uh, you know, I think that I got involved with her mostly because of Arif Marden, the producer. Mm -hmm. And that's how we sort of start, first started getting to know each other. And then after that, I did a few other albums with her, with, with other producers, great Frank Filippetti, uh, the wonderful Paul Samuel Smith, who produced Cat Stevens and was the bass player of the band, The Yardbirds. Mm -hmm great talented English fellow mm -hmm. produced one of the albums so yeah Carly so great. all right so Carly there was Shaka there was Phoebe there was Cher there was Bette Midler uh, uh, Melissa Manchester Barbara Streisand what was it like playing with Barbara it was interesting because she's in the studio she uh whenever something challenging would happen and she would screw up like a seven eight bar or some something weird was in the music that was not like normal. She would say, what do you want from me? I'm an actress. So I try to imagine what she says on the set when she said, <laughs> what do you want from me? I'm a singer. singer. Yeah. <laughs> well, how about with Shaka? When did you play with Shaka? Um, we did that album, I'm Every Woman, you know, mm -hmm. the album, her first solo album, which was just, I think it was just called Shaka maybe. Mm -hmm. that, that was her first foray as a studio as a uh, so, sorry solo artist after rufus and you know because again arif martin produced that that stuff and he was just incredible to work with and he's 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 a guy who can work with a shaka or an aretha or a celine or a barbara or a, you you name it and or a bet Bette Midler's done, I did a few albums with him with Bette. That's when I first met him actually, it was an early Bette record. Okay, so now wait, you played with Bette with Barry Matt, like Bet, early Bette, right? That was a road gig the first the first time we worked together. That was that tour, her first national tour where Barry was the MD, the musical director. And yeah, and then subsequently he got a deal for himself and I was in his first touring band as well. Okay, so wait, what was that like in those really early days when when Barry's the MD for Bet and that whole uh, that whole gay thing was exploding? She was the queen. Were you playing bathhouses with them? Were you playing bigger? What, what was it when you were playing with them? She had already had uh, at least Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy was huge song and maybe some others I can't remember but uh it was big cities and packed you know packed houses in fact um did, did have you ever heard of Don Grolnick I don't think so the great great uh pr producer songwriter produced a bunch of James Taylor albums um he had a subtle sense of humor uh, every night, the audience was like really couldn't wait to see Bette Midler come on, onto the stage in their town. It was like a huge deal. So Grolnick, you know, so we would always uh, start with the band coming out and filing out onto the stage first, and the audience would always go nuts because they knew it was ha this is starting to happen. It was happening now. <laughs> Grolnick would always he'd have a jacket and a collared shirt, and he would go. What do you think, guys? In or out? <laughs> Just let the audience decide. And then he would walk out and to a huge applause. <laughs> That's a very subtle sense of humor. <laughs> you all um, get so did you play with Bar Barry by the time he left Bet? He he was a force unto himself. Like the women must have got, been going crazy when Barry would hit the stage. I can't even imagine. It was pretty great. I mean, the, the venues weren't as big yet because he had just had that first album and Mandy wasn't happening yet. Mm -hmm. But he did have Could It Be Magic. Mm -hmm. 
That was his first sort of biggie from the radio. I think that everybody knew at the time. Mm -hmm. And then we, we would fill up the set with interesting things like a medley of commercials that he had been a part of, like for State Farm Insurance. And in fact, this is really not the most proud thing ever, but there's <laughs> there's something on, on YouTube from the Mike Douglas show of us doing that medley. And it's pretty bizarre. I'm going to be going looking for that after uh, we get off the air. That sounds fun. <laughs> so, all right. So, Will, so you go from doing all, all of these artists, all of these jingles, how do you get late night? Oh, again, from having played on these, you know, from from the studio work, mm -hmm. that led to playing on albums that people were listening to everywhere in the world, including Canada, where Paul Schaefer was from and had come down to New York. Um, this is this is the very beginning of why that was possible. He. Uh, I got a call to come in and do a session for for a, for a guy named Paul Jabara. And it was, this was uh, being produced by Ron Dante, who was the guy that produced all those early Barry Manilow hits, right? Ron Dante, brilliant musician, singer. He was the he was the voice of the Archies. I was going to say, yeah, I remember. Yeah, I, I've seen him recently, actually. Oh, great. Yeah, he's a sweet guy, One, a great friend. He's we're still in touch. He's just a great guy. And um, so he was somehow Paul Jabara, I believe, got him to be the producer of this these sessions that he was doing. And Paul Schaefer was was Paul's arranger, if I remember correctly. I, no, none of us knew who Paul Schaefer was, but he was just in town from from Canada. Mm -hmm doing the uh, the magic show on Broadway, which was a, a show that had Doug Henning was the star. I don't know, know much about the content of that show, but in, it involved magic and music. And from the minute Paul Schaefer and I met, he he was really aware of me from all the stuff that I he had seen me on on records and stuff. And by this point, Ron had produced a few Manilow hits and stuff. Mm -hmm. And Schaefer knew all about those and stuff. And we just got along so great that from that first day, we've always been really great friends since the first day we met. It's always been like this mutual respect thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we checked out, 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 out each other's fashions, what we were wearing and, you know, talked about, because Schaefer's all over music. I mean, he knows everything. He knows jazz, he knows classical, and he knows, you know, theme songs from countries and he knows, you know, you name it. He knows everything, all the British stuff, all the, all the girl group stuff, you know, all the great Supremes and Motown stuff. And so he's just a great guy to bounce off of, you know, musically and, and humor wise. Mm -hmm. So fast forward a little bit. He he and I had at this point now done a bunch of bunch of projects together. We played on Share Records out in L.A. and other. We played on some Barry Manilow stuff. He he'd been on too, and just odds and ends sessions all over town. And he uh, he was also friends with a bunch of guys that I had a band with: Steve Jordan and Hiram Bullock and Clifford Carter. And I had a band called the Twenty Fourth Street Band. Mm -hmm. And that band, you know, for our second album, Schaefer was in the studio with us hanging out the whole time. We were all getting along great and having just a blast hanging out together. And then the 24th Street band kind of was folding, was breaking up. And right about that time, Schaefer got a call from Letterman to, to do that first, you know, first nighttime Letterman show. Mm -hmm. and Shave said to me, look, I got this idea to, to, to do this talk show. I just got asked if I'd be the, uh, the band leader on this talk show. And it's, you know, it's a, and like, what I'd like to do is, is like, El is instrumental Motown, Beatles and Stones and James Brown, basically, as the music. And I thought, well, wow, that sounds like fun. I said, and, and he was asking me if I would do it. And I said, when does it start? And he said, next week. And I said, well, man, let's go, let's go sit down and learn some songs. You know, let's get some material together. 
so I think we, that night we started looking at like tears of a clown and, you know, and, and by the way, um, you and Paul are the only two that started on the first day and went to the last day, correct? Right. But the other two guys that he hired were the guys in the 24th street band, Hiram Bullock and Steve Jordan. Mm -hmm. Minus the keyboard player, Cliff Carter, because it's right. really been fun. He didn't need that, but he did need this band of people that he knew could handle all these kinds of music, you know? Mm -hmm. So he just kind of took this ready-made band and plopped them into his his sphere for this to be the, the core of this show back in 1982. And the rest is hysteria. And so... At the time, of course, you had no idea what was about to happen and the fact that you would play with every musician that has ever been on the planet of the face of the earth every every hero, I'm assuming that no, it was a call for it. It was a 13 week gig. We're going to do this pilot. You know, it wasn't like we're going to do this show for 33 and a third years. It was <laughs> what are you doing for the next 13 weeks? And, it's, and I'd never heard of making of, st of a steady gig that was 13 weeks long. And I was like, 13 weeks of solid mu solid work, unbelievable. And right. it doesn't have to be Broadway. Did you, so, did you ever do Broadway? I've never asked you that. I think I sat in on like Grease, yeah. maybe. Mm -hmm. And I did a little play with Melina McCurry that didn't take off. It was called um, Lissi Strata, mm -hmm. based on the fabulous Greek, you know, story of the women boycotting the, the soldiers so they wouldn't go to war, mm -hmm. boycotting sex. And that was kind of cool. It was short lived, but not much, not much Broadway for me. So I'm going to ask you about highlights of, of the Letterman years. But as you know, my husband uh, was on Late Show for four years as the, the head monologue writer. You know, Gabe. Yeah. You know that, right? Yeah, you know that. Yeah, and um, and so came to I came a number of times to the set and always when Darlene Love was there every year that was always a highlight for me to be there live and see that happen oh my god um, so for you you played with everybody on there did any did did you ever like I'm sure it happened more than once we oh my god I can't believe I'm gonna play with today oh yeah. Like, like who, who blew your mind that you got to, to do that? Every, I, I mean, know. Iggy Pop, Melissa Etheridge, uh, God, I don't even know where to start with that one. Robert, you know, uh, God, Stevie Winwood, Clapton, Eddie Van Halen. Were some of those like experiences like just so fun because of the connection you got to make with somebody who was a hero and you would have a moment with them. Yeah, Barry White came on. <laughs> we were looking for an end to his song. He was doing a song and, and the song could have ended like, and I said, hey man, you know what would be cool? I said, wouldn't it be nice if we just went like, we're quiet like that. And he goes, right on. <laughs> right on. You know, Dave was also great about uh, giving platform to new bands that people had, new artists that people didn't. Right. Like yeah. very early in their careers, Elvis Costello. I mean, I, there were tons of people that he gave a huge platform to that. Yeah, like a lot of people's first national TV exposure, REM all kinds of people that he would find, you know, I mean, Warren Zevon was practically oh. a regular on the show, right? Did you, know. did you ever go to Dave and say, I've heard, did anybody ever go to Dave and say, Hey, did you ever, did, have you heard this band or this person or? I did it and I didn't have any success with my suggestions. Okay. By that time, there was a quite a crew of people that had his ear. Yeah, there was a little bit of a power pyramid thing going on there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so Will, how did the uh, the Fab Folk? So, 
I know you also have had the opportunity, I think, to play with all of the be Did you play, play with yeah. all of the Beatles? Okay, so tell those stories. I well, want to hear, I want, I want each one because I'm in awe. Uh, well, you know, it's, it's not like a, I had a career with each of these guys. I mean, if they gave me a career, needless to say, they were my spark and still are. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've had the opportunity to play with, with Ringo here and there a few times, you know, I think one, maybe the first time he came on Letterman, maybe the first time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Another time was uh, when the Beatles were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, Ringo was back at the drum kit, so that was really exciting. So who was there? Ringo and George? Maybe. I think they were on the outs with Paul at the time, so he wasn't at that one. But Paul came in again as a solo artist a few years later, and that might have been the first time He's such a charming guy. Mm -hmm. I remember when he came on stage <clears throat> and it was not too long after Linda had passed away, I think. And nobody thought he was going to even show up, much less want to jam at the end of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony. So I, I think I, I think I had a, my Hofner bass, the, my violin shaped Hofner bass mm -hmm. there to play Beatles stuff. In case anything came up, we you know we'd play on play them on or whatever. But when he hit the stage, he passed by me and I said, "Oh man, I wish I'd brought because I have a left-handed one as well as the one that I had on stage." I said, "Man, I I really wish I'd brought my left-handed Hofner for you to play." And he goes, "Oh, you really messed up this time." <laughs> and as, a, as years later, I gave him that bass, but that's a whole other story. Um, what? It was the first M McCartney experience. Yeah, that was that's something I did for myself for my 64th birthday. Wow. I left the base. Wow. Gift to myself. Wow. Uh, uh, and how about John? Did you play with John? Only technically because on Ringo's album called R Roto Gravior, he's got a song on there called Cooking in the Kitchen of Love. And it's a John Lennon song. And I think they had already recorded the song, but wanted to replace the bass. So again, Arif Martin, my buddy producer that I did like 26 albums with, all in total, all total, um, called me in to, to play a new bass track on this Ringo song that was John Lennon's tune. And John had already been on the track playing keyboards. He was in the session that they had done in LA, I believe, playing mm -hmm. piano. So that, in that way, I played with John. Well, well, that counts. We're gonna we're gonna let that one count. It did for me because, first of all, it was Ringo's record, and that was already a thing. But then to find out that it was John's tune and he was playing, I basically asked him to crank up John's part and played as much as I could to that feel and to that you know intent that that was that he had put on the record. Wow! Really match up with that energy, you know. So that 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 thing that the Beatles, which propelled you to get into music and then having experiences with all of them. How did the Fab Faux come to be? The Fab Faux was, was something that was, uh, again, it had never occurred to me to, to have a Beatles uh, band, though I had everything that I have, have ever done musically. There's a Beatles thread running under through everything, whether it's jazz, gospel, R&B, country wow with always what would the beatles do you know kind of subconsciously going on in my head always mm -hmm. because i learned so much from those from those records you know and and the records more than the live stuff so when you see when you think of a beatles band a lot of times and even i'm guilty i would think of guys up there with suits on pretending to be somebody else pretending to be the real thing and so maybe for that reason, it, it was it never occurred to me to 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 join in that kind of a situation and have a Beatles band, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But then um, I was I did a little a little miniature tour of Europe with uh, Hiram Bullock, who always loved to have a trio and have 
everybody in the band be able to sing. He loved the three part harmony, but didn't want any more than three guys to travel with to, you know, for expense reasons and everything else, I guess. Mm -hmm. So he was really had really gotten used to having a guy on drums that could play great and sing. And when I heard, uh, I'd never heard of this guy, Rich Pagano, until until he got hired to do uh, the drummer chair for a small tour of Europe for Hiram. Mm -hmm. um, and I heard him sing and I heard him play. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I, I, I heard something that was really interesting. I heard a very Ringo-esque informed style of playing drums. But then when he sang, I heard something very John Lennon going on. And after the tour, it never occurred to me still, but after the tour, I remember I was sitting, I'd gone to Bermuda and was at some friend's house, house that had invited me to Bermuda to play. And I went to their house, they made me dinner and they had an acoustic guitar in the house. This and might I, be a really good time to do this. I started to play like, like anything, but, and I realized the only thing I know is, is Beatle music. I don't know, I can't sit down and jam other people's songs, you know? You know, again Cause I told you won't speak for goodbye But I came back again I love you so well And I could just sit down and play a Beatles song for these guys. I could serenade them after they made me dinner. And I thought, okay, that's 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 cute. And then I was back in New York a few days later, and I'm sitting at the China Club next to the guy who books the bands there. And we're watching somebody play. I think G.E. Smith and the guys were playing, and his guys were playing a show. And I'm standing next to the guy who books the music. And at that point, Tommy just, Allen. Tommy Allen. Sweetest cat in the world. Great drummer. Super great energy. And I looked at Tommy and I said, Tommy, if I put a Beatles band together, would you? Would you hire us to play here? And he goes, sure. Okay. I went back home, called Rich Pagano, who sang like John Lennon, who played like Ringo. And I said, look, we got to do this. And I didn't know anybody else except for Jimmy Vivino that I that I wanted to be in the band. I knew Jimmy Vivino had to be in the band. And I hound, we lived had in the you and, Had you and Jimmy played together before? Yeah, a lot of times. A lot of times. And, you know, I knew him to be like a real archiving historian with music and oh, yeah. everything about everything. And okay, so he's got to be the guy. But he, he didn't think so. He wasn't convinced yet. And he lived in my building. And I lived on the 33rd floor. And he lived on like the 28th floor. Mm -hmm. And we'd be coming home from Letterman and heading up to our apartment. And I'd be, I'd have him cornered and I'd say, look, man, you got to do this band. We got to do this band. And he was like, no, fucking way, man. I don't want to be in a Beatles band. What are you talking about? I'm a blues guy, you know? All right, I'll see you tomorrow. Well, he wasn't doing Conan yet? Or was he already doing? He was? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. He really busy. He didn't need mm -hmm. anything else. But he, you know, he's, all, he's always up to, to gig around and play, you know, on the side. Mm -hmm. But it, and this wasn't the thing that was interesting in, to him until I kept just hounding him and hounding him until he finally realized, I think this guy might be serious about this, you know, and he finally broke down and joined the band. But then I didn't really know anything else uh, about who, who the next person had to be in the band, but I knew there had to be five people because it seemed to me that what we wanted to do was not be that dress up version of the Beatles. We wanted to be, bring those records to the stage, you know, with all those great extra sounds and the doubled vo vocals and the percussion parts and the keyboard parts and stuff that made some of those records super magical. Right. Yeah. So I knew it had to be like five guys to do this. We needed five people. We couldn't do it with four because there would be, we'd be back to those, to the rut that those other lookalike bands were in. They can right. only from a certain period and that would be it. 
you know, we wanted to do walrus in strawberry fields, you know, because we had our great singer on drums. We could do this, but we need more than four guys. So that's why I had to be a five piece band. Can you tell the story? I love the story about uh, you learned everything note by note. And I saw you do the White Album and I saw you do Revolution number nine. <laughs> Can you tell how you, uh, because that's, that's quite some stuff you gotta learn right there. Uh, what was that experience like for you, Will? How much time do you have on this thing? How much time do we have? <laughs> okay, so the White Album, it's got all these songs and it's got this one piece of whatever you want to call it soundscape that's about seven or eight minutes long called revolution nine which is comprised of who knows what when you hear it it's just like an it's just like you're on acid you don't know what the hell's going on there's classical bits playing being played backwards there's spoken lines there's stuff on coming off the radio you know there's odd baby crying and tape machines re rewinding backwards and just all this these elements and we had been to liverpool and saw a band who it was during a time when um they they took their like top eight or ten bands and asked everybody during this one particular year to to do an album each and one of the two of the bands were had the assignment to do the the white album and each band was assigned to do side a and b of the first disc if you will and the other band was was hired to do the other stuff and the other stuff the other disc had revolution number no. nine on it and these guys were coming up to me bragging to me saying man you got to come up here us do revolution number no. nine it's going to be unbelievable you're not going to believe it it's you know it's going to be it's going to blow your mind we, we got we figured out how to do it I said all right i can't wait can't wait to see this. These guys are really good musicians, and I can't wait to see how they treat this thing. Uh -huh. And I, get, and when they got to that song, it was like they, one guy was doing like Jimi Hendrix feedback. Another guy had a puppet of John Lennon going up and down behind the piano, coming out from behind the piano, going number nine. And I got so angry. <laughs> and I said, That's it. We're going to do number nine we're going to put this together right the right way we're going to do it properly we're going to really do it so frank agnello who's one of the band members i knew he would be able to sort of uh locate like what all these sound pieces are that that make up some of these oddball sounds that you hear on that on that track mm -hmm. and sure enough researched the hell out of it and found out like this this bach piece and this other thing and you know what's what and, and which part of this of who's who's performance on which gramophone recording you know can we do we have to go to to get the real parts and the real stuff so we figured out what all the little needs were all the little elements that make up this eight minute piece and we started replicating some we started recording some classical records backwards. We started really getting into it and finding out how to, you know, what was needed. And so now the challenge is you gotta have, you gotta, how do you script this for five people to do this? Like, it's a mess, it's stuff's everywhere. Like one guy's gonna be sitting at a piano and how do we, you know, one, one guy can't trigger all the samples. There's gotta be two guys doing it, you know? And, and the sound has to be good enough that when, because everybody's triggering off, of, they're like, we're like actors. Everybody's triggering off what the last guy did. Like you don't jump on your, your line before the other guy's finished. So you got to really be able to hear all these little subtle things that are going on so that you come in at the right time at the right place. So our sound checks for these were really massive. That was the longest part of the sound check was when we tried to, to get the balances for that piece. And we had to ask the audience to be completely silent, you know, and we had to have the lights up so we could read our scripts. And uh, because of Sandrine and I had just gotten married mm -hmm. and I was sitting in my little studio, which was in a separate building from our house that we had in Connecticut. 
work trying to work this this thing out and she's in, in the house going i just married a guy i haven't seen him for days <laughs> what kind of a marriage do i have what kind of a relationship do i have with this guy and it was literally like i was so uh working so hard to get this together and try to figure it out and i sort of couldn't completely figure it out she came up with the idea of of how to script it how to you know make it like one minute per page 10 seconds per line everybody's timeline is the same looks the same we can see each other's stuff and it was brilliant she worked it out she made it possible wow it. yeah because it was really tough to figure out well before you put the guitar down um, we've been talking for, I could talk to you all day, but I'm figuring it's getting late in France. Um, but can you tell everybody, <laughs> we moved the time of the show so that it would work for you in France. And then last night you realized about daylight savings time and you said, oh no, that's supper time. And I was like, he's going to make me move the show so that they could eat some like food. T tell us why uh, dinner time is important to you, Will, over there in France. <laughs> it's a good story. A guy's got to eat. Well, no, you have a little ritual, though. Well, you have to eat together as a family. You know, you get your little aperitif happening. There's a TV show on that's kind of that's very cool. That's a, that's a show that's a contest for people to come in and see if they can remember all the lyrics to a song. It's a big, like, very popular show over here in France. And um, Sandrine's mom does not like to miss that show. And you sit around at the coffee table and you watch that show while having a aperitif, you see. But now it's in French. Can you, do you understand French? Well, it's music. You know, I'm listening to the music. Okay. It's, right. you know, I've got something I can focus on. And it's, they have an amazing house band and the killer singers, a violinist who's a wonderful, great drummer and a bass player who's really fantastic. And I get to just like take lessons from these guys while, I'm, while everybody else is spouting out spewing out things in french that you wouldn't hear in the states lots of stuff some you would some are actually songs like you know what's a big a big uh, a big a big hit that they that actually comes back and a lot on this show mm -hmm. uh we know it as a song by i think sheena easton that goes my baby takes the morning train. What? You remember that one at all? I do remember it, but why would that be a big thing? I don't know, but okay. not that song. It's that it's everything about that song except for it's not about a morning train. <laughs> you know, it's not Sheena Easton. But it's a really, really big song. So there's a few songs like that that you hear that you recognize. Uh, uh, in fact, the song, well, it's the same old song, but with a different name that says, hey, you've been gone, it's the same. There, there's a version of that over here. It's, it's called La, La, uh, La Même Chanson, you know? And it's almost the same, but it's not the four tops. <laughs> it's not Motown. It's a whole other thing. So, you know, there's a lot of things that that you sort of recognize. And then there's a lot of really beautiful songs. And when you find out what the lyrics are, you just go, man, nobody can write lyrics like that and get away with it in the States. It's just too meaningful. You know, Wow. some of the Jacques wow. Brel stuff and just heartbreaking lyrics. French, there's so many great French writers over over the over time and then but then a lot of american schlock is also kind of filtered into their little into their groove as well well i think it's really lovely that you have this family ritual in the middle of this COVID thing uh that you have your little bubble of safety and that you have you know for some of us many watching we've gone through this alone for the most part. i live alone my i haven't seen my it's it's rough so it's really nice it's lovely that you hold fast to that ritual and that you have this little bubble. There's also a dog in the house, and that's really good for comic relief. I have to say. <laughs> and also it gets you out of the house. You got to go walk the dog, right? So that's, 
It's yeah. really, really valuable in that way. Absolutely. You have to walk them. Or he starts so well, before we go, can I talk you into doing uh, one of those Beatles songs that uh, we know and love so well? Oh, I'll try. It's getting a little late for my voice, but I'll try. Okay, try. We won't judge you. We'll <laughs> love you. It's, it's not going to sound great on this guitar because this is. I bought this for sixty bucks at a flea market. Oh, nice. <clears throat> My real little song goes something like this. <clears throat> oh shit, that's terrible. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Take these broken wings and learn to fly. All your life. Only waiting for this moment to arrive. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Take these sunken eyes and learn to see all your life. You were only waiting for this moment to be free. Blackbird fly. To the light of a dark black night Black bird fly Black bird fly Into the light of a dark black night Blackbird singing in the dead of night Take these broken wings and learn to fly All your life This moment to rise, you were only waiting for this moment to rise. You were only waiting for Vicki Abelson's moment to rise. Thank you so much, Will. Thanks for doing this. I know it's bedtime. Um, <laughs> uh, boy, nothing like a thirty-six dollar guitar, however much it costs. Um, I adore you. It was great to see you. I can't, I can't wait to see you on a stage very soon, I pray. I hope you don't feel too lonely. Well, out here, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm making do. I, I have a beau that comes to visit once in a while, so. Good. That's okay. Um, Good. Please send my best to Sandrine and your mother-in-law and have a wonderful sleep. And thanks so much for doing this. All right. Great to see you. Thanks for the invite. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, anytime. See you soon. Bye-bye.